So our first Frank is going to be my first coat. And I learned something many years ago from Cheng Kachi, and some of you were in that workshop with me. Um, he always puts down a non-staining color first because it's a buffer between all the rest of the layers of paint, and then you can go back and lift. And um, he was really right. I have used it ever since then. I either use raw sienna or cerulean blue or cobalt blue because all three of those are weak colors, and you, they're non-staining, and you can lift back. I need to get a drink water, sorry. Okay, I am going to start by just putting raw sienna everywhere that isn't white. I've got a few white stripes in his hair, not too many, because he's still got some, some color there. Lucky I got hair. <laughs> you do have hair. I'm going to go around everything that's white. There's a lot of white on his glasses, so I'm kind of not going to worry about those right now. And I was supposed to leave that bow right there white, but on my step two, I've already got it dry. I did a better job, so. You don't tell anybody I screwed up. The whole audience will never know. So what color is that? This is raw sienna. I am not, oops, I'm sitting on my wire. I'm not worried about any um, edges right now because one of the wonderful things about this paper is that I can go back six years from now and soften all my edges if I want to. Um, even if, you know, it doesn't matter if they're dry. Um, in fact, it's easier to do it dry than it is wet. I've got a white stripe right there where his little smile line is. There's nothing white out here. You can see I'm not being at all careful about it being blotchy. Um, I'm just literally painting shapes. I know, I remember that there's one white right here on his neck. You can see I'm being extremely careful and painstaking. Okay, now his face is pretty much, oh wait, I have to do his lip here. Everything that's going to have color on it, I want either this raw sienna or I'm going to put blue on his shirt. So the blue on his shirt is going to be cerulean blue. I had a student once that I always used to say cerulean, and she said there's a U in that word. It's cerulean. And so now I say it right and everybody thinks I'm insane. I had one of those students, too. Did you? <laughs> it was probably the same student. Now I'm just going to leave a few whites in, in his shirt. Not a lot, but just a few. Being real careful here. And over here I'm just going to color the whole thing in blue. Oops, that's right. I was using that turquoise so much last week that I keep wanting to go into that turquoise. Okay, now I'm going to put a few streaks of blue in his hair because he does have gray hair and, you know, blue makes good gray. There. Now, my first coat is totally done. Now, Now, you can see that I was, you know, I did exactly the same thing. This is all raw sienna. Now, I did mix a little bit of gray and put it here in just a few places on his hair. But other than that, oh, and I did a much neater job on his shirt, too, didn't I? But anyway, so now the second um, coat, I'm going to throw this down. So you here. said you, you painted gray. Did you make something different? It's ultramarine blue and burnt sienna which is kind of my go-to gray for everything. And um, I probably use ultramarine blue and burnt sienna in every painting that I do. I could, back when I was painting watercolor a lot, I swear I could buy it by the vat. And um, luckily they're both A's, you know, they're both the cheapest color. Um, I still use mostly Holbein paint, um, but I have discovered a new one, which you probably have all heard of, it's QOR core. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, after doing collages and doing a, maybe a little bit of acrylic, I discovered all the oxide colors that 
you know, didn't used to be in watercolor. And I have one of the core colors that I have on here is um, quinacridin. Now, gold. No, it's quinacridin gold oxide. Quinacridin yellow oxide. That's it. Yeah, and it is right here. I'll show you what color it is. This I always for that color. I always used to use Holbein's Indian yellow. This is Holbein's Indian Yellow right there. Oh, okay. okay, let me bring it over here. Okay, so this right here is Indian Yellow right there. And the, this new one is, it, and it looks really dark on here. But look what, oh, wait a minute, that's not it. <laughs> oh, it's right here. Sorry, erase that last one. It's right here. And it still looks dark. But look what color it is. And it's even brighter than that. Um, it's just a beautiful color. Look at that. I mean, you could eat it. So I haven't used any of the other core colors yet, but if, if they're anything like that, um, one of the reasons I like Holbein um, is because it's much easier to reconstitute it, toot it in the palette. Um, it stays wet like this. It doesn't ever dry out and get into the little crummy pieces like Winsor Newton does. Winsor Newton is actually designed not to squeeze it in your palette and leave it there. It's actually designed to use fresh. But um, Holbein is designed to do this, and so it stays really wet. It's really easy to um, just barely wet it. I now have it all over my hand. And um, reconstitute it into a really thick, rich paint. Um, without spraying it with water first or anything like that. Another one of my shortcuts. Okay. I'm going to really get into more of the detail of painting when we get farther on Frank. But my next coat is going to be, um, I use certain colors for um, adult skin, certain color, and that it's all in my book, but um, adult skin I like to use raw sienna and, and either alizarin crimson or carmine. <coughs> The equivalent of alizarin crimson in whole bind paint is carmine, and it's much cheaper than alizarin crimson. So I switched to it years ago. So um, that's what I use for an adult skin tone. For a child, I like to use aureolin or aurelian, I don't know the right way to say it, and um, permanent red or Windsor red, so that those are really clear yellow and reds, whereas the adult skin is more of a sallow color. Um, you'll notice by my paintings, um, I paint a lot of dark-skinned people. They're much more fun to paint than light-skinned people because their skin is so much more um, reflective of all the color around. Plus you can put any kind of crazy colors in there. And um, it's much more fun to paint black people as, than it is, you know, kind of pasty white people. But <laughs> you, we do what we have to do. Not that you're pasty and white, Frank. You're not. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to mix some of my skin color here and have it sitting there. So there's my, now that might have some of that wild yellow in it, but Frank will be a little jaundice, he won't mind. <laughs> so for this coat, I'm going to actually use burnt sienna. And I'm going to paint every, oh, I need my value study. I'm going to paint everything on here except for the lightest lights um, and the whites. The whites are already painted, and now I'm going to leave the lightest lights and paint in the darker pieces. And I didn't have a great marker here, but you can kind of see where my darker pieces are. Um, usually I use these Prismacolor markers, and I didn't have the medium gray, so I kind of fudged. But So hopefully you can see what I'm doing here. So I'm looking at this, and I'm going to paint need a little more paint. I also don't believe in using a tiny brush. Um, my mother always said, and you probably heard her, my students over there, um, never send a boy out to do a man's job. And so I don't. So I'm going to paint all of my darks here. It's been a while since I painted this, Frank, and now I'm kind of forgetting. Mm. I think I might do better to look at this. 
that's better. Now I can see Frankie. The nice, another nice thing, like I said about this paper, is that no matter, even if I do make a mistake, I can always go back and lighten it later, and you will see how easy it is to do that. It's almost, I think it's like cheating. But please don't tell anyone I said that. If you have any questions along the way, feel free to ask me. I'm trying to leave, like here's a white, I'm trying to leave a little of that raw sienna. Now we're going to get on to your nose here, Frank. There's just a little white line there. but So these shapes Such are a little darker. Work. Pardon? Such a classic. Oh, it is. It is. It's a um, Elizabethan nose. That sounds good, don't you think? Yeah. I read that in some book. I don't really know what it means, but. I had so much fun painting this, and um, because I hadn't seen Frank in a while, and it was like he was sitting right in front of me. Probably telling you what to do. I'm sure. Yeah. You weren't as mouthy. You really weren't. No. Oh, another thing about this board, and I wonder if you can see it. Can you see how it's getting little bumps yeah. on it? Yeah, um, that is actually flaws in the board. And it never used to do this, but the last 10 years, I think it's places, because it is so many layers fused together, I think it's little places where it separates a little bit. But once that dries, it goes away. So don't panic. When you see that happen, don't start screaming and think that you wrecked your whole painting, because you didn't. And every time I do this, I probably do it a little bit differently. When I bring the one out that this, this is already done, it'll probably look totally different than this one. But. Because I think every time you do it, you see the shapes a little differently. And that's all right. You can put these layers on as thick as you want. Um, I find that if I haven't painted in a while, I kind of sneak up on it more um, than when I've painted for quite a while and will just kind of go for the gusto and start slapping it on. When do you use softened edges? Um, I'm going to show you in the next step. Okay. It, it's weird not to even worry about it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I can actually wait, if I want, until the absolute last layer to do it. Um, if I go back and soften it out and I lift too much, all I have to do is let it dry and yeah. add more in. How would your technique change for a very small piece on the paper? Um, it really doesn't change. I mean, I would maybe use a smaller brush, but it wouldn't change at all. Um, and when when I first have my first coats on this, it winds up looking like a patch, kind of a patchwork quilt or a pinto, and and that's okay um, because I'm going to smooth it out later, which makes no sense at all. I know, but it really will later. I promise. Somebody didn't turn off their phone. Probably me. I hope that's not my phone ringing. <laughs> okay, so there is coat two on Frank. Okay. Oh, wait, I forgot a step. Okay, now I'm also going to put in some of the darkest darks and before I'm softening anything. I know you all right now think I'm crazy and half drunk, but I'm really not. So I have mixed burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, but I want it to lean more towards the burnt sienna. There's a million ways to make um, black or gray. This just happens to me to be the easiest one. Now I'm just going in and putting in the darkest pieces that I see on Frankie's face. 
which looks really strange, but you will see why I'm doing this later. Is it lighten a lot? Pardon me? Not when it dries, it will be a lot lighter? No, that's, that's one of the main reasons, that's a thing I forgot to tell you about this board. Thank you for asking that. It stays like it looks wet. Because it sits on top, it doesn't fade back like watercolor paper does. And as you can see from some of my paintings when you look at them later, I like to go from white to black. Um, some artists don't think you should go all the way across the value scale. I like to do that. I figure if it was good enough for Rembrandt, it's good enough for me. Yeah. Um, if he had black in his paintings and white in his paintings, why can't I? So I, because when you're entering a juried show, you only have usually a, from five to 10 seconds to grab the juror's attention. You can do it with color, you can do it with line, or you can do it with value. I do it with value. Um, all of my paintings have really dark darks and white whites. And whether the judge likes it or not, it will get the, their attention. And um, John Salmonen told me that, that he had, has judged American Watercolor and National Watercolor Society many times. And he said when they flick through those slides, they usually land on them only for about three to four seconds. So, and then everybody quick votes, and if everybody doesn't vote for it, it's thrown out. And um, so I figure you gotta grab them quick with something, and I use value. So do you use uh, straight black, or do you make a black? Or no, I always make it with burnt sienna and ultramarine blue, or whatever colors I'm using for that painting, you know, whatever combination would make black. But nine times out of 10, it's burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. Um, and even in my collages, and I should have made some copies of them to bring them, even in my collages, I, go, I don't go totally to black paper, but I go to a blackish paper and a white paper. I mean, I, even in collage, I like that real stark contrast. I always have. I have always told my students to paint like they're rich. Like they can afford to have fifty dollars worth of paint in their water. And if they're afraid to do it, I let them use my paint. And then it's amazing how free they get. <laughs> Although I haven't taught in a long time now, and I, um, I'm teaching a class in January, and it's the first time I've taught. Well, maybe since I closed Avalon Arts. Yeah, I mean a long time. And, uh, huh? You do workshops. Oh yeah, I've done a few workshops, but I was mainly doing those while I was still open there. And uh, yeah, I guess I did teach for Holbein for a while, but anyway, I haven't taught in a while, so it'll be interesting. Now I know this looks weird, but you just have to trust me. Ears are really fun. I love ears and hands because they have so many fun shapes in them. You kind of